thefuseboxshow.com. Positively gracious, good day, evening, afternoon, whatever time it is, wherever you are. Thank you so much for pushing the button here just to see what it's all about. I really appreciate it. This is Fuse Box. It's the first edition, the ignition edition of what I hope to be uh, a series that will go on for a while. And uh, I just uh, am as, <laughs> as tickled as a glitter panda. To be here right now, it's a a real thrill to finally kind of dive in the water with all the folks that I've been listening to since 2005. That's right. More about that history later, but let me just tell you who I am. As a matter of fact... Yeah, who am us anyway? Well, who am us? Well, my name is Mark Rose, and I am a composer, sound designer, voice actor who lives out here in Portland, Oregon. I have a company called Fuse Audio Design, hence Fuse Box, Stomp Box, Soap Box, yeah, whatever. So I'm I'm doing... Oh, man, you're so clever, you make me sick. <laughs> Thanks. So I'm um, I'm sort of excited to be doing this. It's, it's not the first time that, uh, that I've ventured into podcasting, and we'll get to that sordid history a little later on, but... Uh, in the interim, I, the the desire to do this has really stemmed from listening to Frank and uh, the Ansa group there for, for so many years now that uh, at first I thought, I'm not really sure I have anything to contribute to this. I don't know what people would find interesting. And then it dawned on me what I do for a living. And I thought, well, you know, maybe that would be of interest to somebody. So maybe it will. And I'm hoping to turn this particular program into something that will be good. Um, Yes, it will be kind of monologue heavy at at times. It will also feature stuff, well, like this. Having fallen asleep in a room full of crash test dummies, Todd became the victim of a horrific case of mistaken identity. Oh, my dear God! Ah! More blasts from the past. But anyway, so um, who am I and why am I here and all that good stuff? Well, because I, like many of you, I, I think this is a wonderful medium. And I've been inspired by the folks uh, who have been doing this program on the network for some time. The honesty... That sort of uh, little glimpse into somebody's life, their process, sometimes the difficult times they're going through, sometimes the, the wonderful times, whatever it is, that's a privilege, in my mind anyway, that we get to see that in somebody else and experience that and, and then relate it to our own lives if, uh, if that applies or even if it doesn't, frankly. Some of the experiences people have, I haven't had, but wow, sure is fun for the ride. So uh, I'm kind of excited to do that. And uh, I guess if, if I'm going to start anywhere on this... What the hell are you saying? <laughs> shut up. If I'm going to start anywhere on this, it's going to be with where it, it this all began for me, I would suppose, um, which will, believe me, will make sense with podcasting and all that. I started in broadcast, actually back in uh, 1979. Uh, my writing partner, Gerald McQuinn, and I pitched a radio series to a... Uh, a then fledgling radio station in lovely Tampa, Florida. And uh, by God, they thought it was cool. (laughs) 
I don't know what kind of mushrooms they were drinking, but whatever. Uh, we pitched a series uh, called Dry Smoke and Whispers Radio Theater. My name is Emil Song, special detective. I'm a telepath. My people have been outlawed for two centuries. That's why I hate injustice and use my talents here in my home, Met, to fight a ceaseless, some say futile war against greed and corruption. This is my mission, through this life and out the other side, through dry smoke and whispers. And I gotta tell you, the pitch that we gave those delightful people had nothing to do with what you just heard as the open. What we pitched those people was uh, hammered and glued together on a reel-to-reel deck that basically was a microphone passing from one table to another featuring whatever sort of weird conversations might have happened in this imaginary bar. That was it. No characters, nothing. All you got was conversation and sort of, well, that's odd. What's all that about? Well, evidently, the PD thought that there's enough there that he'd give, you know, a half hour of time on a Thursday night to these folks. So uh, there it was. We started off and um, 50 markets and three countries later, uh, the series did, I guess, fairly well. We we haven't returned to that series since 2008. And, and if you're curious about it, the uh, website's drysmoke.com. You can hear all sorts of little bits from folks who have been in it and so forth. Some of them um, will no doubt be joining me on this program uh, as it continues into the future here because they're interesting. I think you'll enjoy them. So it started with that. Uh, we did several stories, uh, all sorts of uh, seasons of all from that in the early 80s now. And then one shining day... A science fiction, although he hates that title, author by the name of Harlan Ellison got a hold of one of these shows. Well, he got a hold of it because he was in town and we went and saw him and put it in his hands. And so when we did that, he said, boy, that sure is arrogant. Let me take this back and listen. And so evidently he did uh, enjoy it very much, um, came over and shook our hands and even gave us a little treatment for a story we, we later, uh, later adapted. But most importantly, he got us into Los Angeles, and uh, we we aired on a program out there, I don't think it's still running, called Hour 25, which was a kind of a science fiction-oriented show, featured all sorts of strange things. Harlan was a frequent guest, Mike Hodel hosted, and they aired this show, and that was that. And it got us some considerable notoriety, obviously, because it's Los Angeles and here's these two guys and it's, you know, pretty well known. Harlan, if you if you don't know, he's he's uh, he's quite the um, maverick of the science fiction world. He is most probably to to many who wouldn't know his work are familiar with A Boy and His Dog, which was transferred into a film back in the uh, was that the 70s it may have been um, with L.Q. Jones. Uh, but he's also written Deathbird stories and I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream and treatments for all sorts of things, sued studios many times for ripping him off, and rightly so, because, well, they did. So he helped us kind of get an, kind of an edge there. And speaking of edge, we ended up in his book called An Edge in My Voice. So if you ever are out there and curious about what he thought about these upstarts, you can read about it. Uh, and and then uh, really from there, uh, there were several other radio programs that uh, we uh, syndicated basically on public radio. Uh, Shriek Show for a while had a, few, a, a little uh, run, Anomaly Calling, uh, a, a show called Bob Sled, Not a Private Eye, and um, eventually just sort of drifted off into the world that overtook me, which is post-production and, and sound design and stuff. And it, it was just too much to handle um, because back in those days, ladies and gentlemen, everything was hardware. PQ will remember this, the Terra tapes, and there are big hardware processors and there's all this stuff. And it's not like it is right now where you can pretty well do a, a, a very self-respecting little podcast on your laptop or your, you know, 
<laughs> your your TAC DR1 or whatever you have. It doesn't matter. It all it all sounds great. Uh, back in the day, it was a little more involved. Flash forward a few dozen million years, and we come to the year 2005. And an associate of mine who I've worked with on projects introduced me, because I really hadn't heard anything about it, about this phenomenon that was happening called podcasting. And there was this big chief honcho type guy named Adam Curry, who apparently was waving the wand over certain people, and they were getting a lot of attention because of that little notoriety. Uh, Adam Curry, of course, being the, uh, well, most of you folks know, but I mean, back in the day, this was this guy was a VJ on uh, VH1 and uh, maybe MTV, but certainly VH1, and got out of that biz, did very well in the computer world, sold out his cyber stuff before the big bang of, you know, 99, did really well, moved to England and was really kind of healthy over there. So he he decided he was going to, you know, kind of throw some logs on the fire of this idea, which, by the way, he didn't create, but he certainly maximized. And uh, uh, people got interested, and you start seeing these these programs distributed. I came across Frank Nora, well, early on 2005, to pay attention to what was actually going on. I, I don't even remember why I stumbled on his particular show. I listened to a lot of them, listened to a lot, you know, Keith and the Girl and all that stuff that was going on. Well, we had the idea that we should do something, but we weren't going to do a, a monologue type show. We thought we'd do a comedy podcast, and we did. We we created this thing called Area 51. Transmission is imminent. Area 51. Now, this show actually had featured some fun stuff, and we, we started to get a little notoriety at the famous, or now infamous, and maybe now even gone, I don't know, Podcast Alley, where in the comedy section, our show was kind of moving up the ranks there, and it was doing okay, and then Adam Curry heard this. Every year, thousands of babies are sold on the South American market and literally tens of thousands of kidneys, livers, and hearts are extracted from voluntary or involuntary donors. Yet few of those who desire a child or who suffer from liver, kidney, or heart failure are able to take advantage of the incredible discounts offered by our South American friends. Indeed, countless hearts, livers, and babies are never claimed. But on July 20th, it's all gonna change! For the first annual Bolivian Baby and Organ Tissue Auction. Infants of all nationalities. Stem cells. Eyes of all colors. Including those difficult to locate hazels. Skin grafts. Lungs. Kidneys. At the Bolivian Baby and Organ Tissue Auction. You name it, and you buy it. Call 1-800-BODY-BUY. That's 1-800-263-9289. Or go to www.bolivianbabyauction.com and register today. The Bolivian Baby Organ Tissue Auction. July 20th in La Paz. Be there. It's a wee pushing the boundaries of taste. I, I mean, you know, but that was sort of the point of the show was just to be sort of aggressive. And so anyway, he heard that, waved his wand, and uh, somehow um, we went from like what was at that point several hundred downloads a week to like 50,000. <laughs> it's like... I don't know how that happened, but uh, wow, that was really cool. I didn't really get us much more point notoriety on the you know podcasty things, but uh, our server sure knew about it. Uh, crashed it actually in a couple of times, so it was incentive to continue to do that. M- the folks I was working with on this show took that whole idea a little more serious, and I, I don't want to even get into that. That was they wanted to start a network and stuff, and I that was not my thing. I'm I'm a producer, and I really enjoy creating stuff like you're hearing. So I, uh, I, I kind of backed out of that. But um, it was an interesting medium. And as many things like this, you know, you do it for about a year or so, particularly if it's production intensive like that. And in our case, it involved people all over the country. And it was very hard to kind of bring them all together at once. Um, yeah, it sort, of, it sort of failed out. And that's what happens with a lot of these things. Um, I'm hoping that's not going to be the case with this because, well, quite frankly, it's just me. So, uh, and all these archives I've got. So, I'm hoping to continue that. 
uh, trend through the future here. And I, I think it would be, uh, you know, it would be a, a fun thing to do. Um, and that's kind of the message, I guess, I want to express here is why I actually want to do this. Because, uh, you know, like, like many of the folks I've heard on, on the network here, uh, everybody has something really valuable to offer. And I hope I can kind of play ball the same way. I'd, I'd love to be able to be that, to contribute something to, of value. Because honesty seems to be uh, the prevailing energy I hear in everybody's thing. And certainly, as I said before, that sort of glimpse into somebody's experience is really valuable. And, and this is really a very unique medium. It's, it's, not, it's not broadcast radio. There's nothing really broadcast uh, thematically about this because broadcasting is an illusion and basically the people you're hearing are liars. <laughs> and, and, and the other thing is they're just, they're actors, you know, and really? that's... You really think uh, that? Yeah, because even Mr. Limbaugh in his prior incarnation as whatever the hell he was, uh, he, he was a, a, a rock and roll jock. You know, so a lot of these folks assume the position and they assume the position of fill in the blank. That'll work in this market and you can do it and you'll clean up. And then there are some really, you know, just whack out sickos out there. But um, but we needn't waste time with them. I have to say, <laughs> you know, in listening to uh, various folks on this network, um, I've been introduced to a few things that I have I would not have found. I can honestly say. And I'm. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking specifically about a radio series called Vic and Sade. And, and the reason I bring this up is as a child, you know, this seems like a very Gene Shepard-esque uh, sort of uh, vision, actually. But, you know, the kid under the, under the covers with the flashlight reading, you know, some like Doctor Strange comic or whatever. Okay, when I was five or six or so, somewhere in there, I became fascinated with old time radio. So I was that kid the five-year-old, you know, up at 11 o'clock at night on a Monday night <laughs> listening to Orson Welles' Tales of the Black Museum and the head of Jefferson Monk and stories like uh, Inner Sanctum, of course, The Shadow and all those incredible things. And it, the funny thing is I was completely captivated by that stuff. I, I didn't know where it came from. I didn't have a context for it, certainly at that age. But it certainly planted some big seeds. I never got rid of it. And so I've always been interested in that, that world and what's happening there. So when uh, uh, Jimbo uh, and, and, and PQ both kind of uh, announced this uh, program or, or, or gave um, examples of it and are continuing to, I never heard it. In the first episode that I heard, I don't even recall the subject now, I just – it. it it sort of took me aback and I didn't really have an opinion. I'd not really heard radio like that. And the second one, I realized that there was something working here beyond, <laughs> beyond what I'm hearing. And then I, third or fourth time through, I realized, well, this is actually genius. And Paul Reimer is, is an unsung great as, as far as I'm concerned. This is not only brilliant acting, but it's brilliant writing. And it's also incredibly cutting edge dialogue choreography because back in those days and i mean that's my instruction even back in those days the overlapping dialogue thing that's not really that's the that's a no go zone because the ear gets very distracted if there's too much stuff going on and if people are talking over one another they do that in radio all the time they don't even like unless of course you are talking about the subgenius but they talk over one another and we kind of lose you know focus that was pretty brave, and I I, I love that. And it's uh, it, even though their cadence was rather reserved, you have all this colliding dialogue going on, and I think that's pretty pretty amazing. Great. Really. Anybody else's ass you want to kiss while we're here? No, I really do. <laughs> I think it's pretty. Get the hell out of here. Uh, so I think um, it's a really great show, and and uh, I've I've enjoyed listening to them. And so I went on to Jimbo's site and. L looked at all that stuff and yeah it's just so much information i i i don't have any idea where 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 to begin or end with something like that that kind of stuff and uh a lot of the things over the years that frank has introduced oh and speaking of frank i think it's uh, only fair to say that back in in those area 51 days when frank uh had done show number 
250? We did this. Hey, hi Frank. It's uh it's Mark here from behind the barbed wire at Area 51. I You know, I got to make this short, but those those guys are after me again. But I, I look, I, I just wanted to congratulate you on show number 250. That's that is a milestone, my friend. And uh when I'm not running from Yeah. Those cats. Overnightscape is my show of choice. I gotta tell you, I love it. Uh, okay. Gotta go. Keep up the great work, Frank. Here's to the next 250. And again, now he's what, you know, 5,000 shows? I don't know, 1,400 or something. Amazing. Uh, we should all be so lucky. But, um,. That is tenacity with a capital T. Actually, not even a capital T. I think a granite stone T with moss growing on it. That's pretty cool. So I, for one, would be delighted to be part of this group. Um, I'm looking forward to doing some fun stuff, bringing some fun people in. and um, It'll be a different perspective because my background is very producy. Really? Can't imagine. Yeah. So I, I do, I, I, that is what I do. That's not more work for me. That's actually play. So this is a show where I get to play and hopefully entertain people at the same time. That's always, always the, uh, the goal. Uh, the other thing I was uh, wanting to mention is that um, at one point, a couple, of, it was a year ago now, year, oh man, time flies, year and a half ago, maybe even, we, uh, we returned to a terrestrial radio for a local program called Society of the Inner Ear. My partner in that program is an, a guy named Sam Mowry, who I will definitely bring in and we'll, we'll do a show. He, he has the voice of Orson Welles. This is one of the most amazing voice talents I've ever worked with, and he's an incredibly generous spirit. But anyway... Uh, we, we thought we were going to do this program for a, a station here in town. It was another public radio kind of thing. We had thought about generating new material, kind of like what we had done in the past. But the producers of the, sh the station said, well, we got a slot opening April 1. Well, for us, that was two weeks away. There's no way, you know, because in, in our minds, we're going to get stuff in the can. It's going to be great. And we'll have 12 shows ready to go before we can we launch the first one. No. So we kind of launched it, and it ended up being uh, old radio broadcasts, archive shows, and that kind of stuff, because there really wasn't enough time to produce anything new, which is what we really wanted to do in the interim. But we did it for a few months, and it just became untenable again, because we, we, you know, we were filling a slot for them, and we really weren't you know, doing whatever. But I do have some shows uh, that we created for them that I think would be cool to just drop in there's a lot of great content there, and so so one of the shows might feature that. So, you know, that's the kind of stuff that I'm looking to do. I'm also looking to do things like honoring the, the, the memory of, of the incredible and great Frank Zappa with this particular thing, anything, anytime, anywhere, for no reason at all. Here's Microwave Madness. Syndicated Food Vision. It's Microwave Madness with Dr. Jessica G. Hello. Good morning. Today, we're going to make some of this. Yes, yes, sir. First, we'll grab one of these. Now, come, come now. And slice it up thusly. Oh, and just saute that. Just like this. Ah, oh, then, one of these. Oh, yes, oh, yes, 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 all right, then, oh, yes. And then we'll tenderize with our little ball-peen hammer, yes? Oh, and then, then just sort of, sort of twist it up and, and grab right here and pull off just a little of this and into the pan with it. Oh, finally, just six or seven of these. Oh, no, five, five, five or six of these. Yes, come, come, come at once. It's a show, and this is your moment. And, and then we'll just want to sort of stun them. 
and randomly apply various cutting, grating, pounding instruments of, of, of cooking. Yes. And into a microwave safe tupper. In we go. Come, come. Yes, yes, yes. Inside. In we go. It's almost over now. And uh, give him a burp. Uh. And into the little modern miracle cooking machine. Time, oh, oh, oh time. About uh, three, uh, well, give it ten. And listen. Listen. There's no substitute for good ears. There we are. Mm. Smell it, my little ones. It's where we're all going, so eat to your soul's content. And we'll return, as is our pleasure, next time on Microwave Madness. Syndicated food vision All right, so this is a, you know, a brief show, perhaps, this time around. You don't say. I suspect it will get longer <laughs> as we, we go on and I test the waters. But uh, I would really appreciate uh, comments or whatever. You can, you can email me at mark at fuseaudiodesign.com. Uh, that's uh, Mark with a C, Mimbat. And I would love to hear anything that you have to say about anything you want. Hopefully, uh, the next installment will feature some more stuff, and uh, as we go along, uh, I will drag people screaming and yelling into this production. So, until our next cartoon. Cartoon.